Hello and welcome to lecture number 4 of Magna Carta 2022. The Magna Carta 2022 is basically a prelims crash course for those of you who are appearing for the upcoming 2022 Civil Services Preliminary Exam. We are on lecture number 4 which is on citizenship and we are going to be covering all that is necessary as far as citizenship is concerned for the upcoming prelims exam. Now let's understand something. In 2021, there was one question on citizenship and this has been the only question on citizenship that has been asked over the past 10 years. And the chances of another question in 2022 to be asked on citizenship is honestly next to none or rather impossible. And therefore, we have to study citizenship in a very, very careful manner just to the right amount of detail to make sure that we've covered all that is essential and we should not spend more time that than is necessary as far as citizenship is concerned. So when we study citizenship for the prelims exam, we'll begin with certain conceptual areas such as the dimensions to citizenship. We will then understand the principles of citizenship and we'll understand principles of citizenship through the policy layout, which means we'll understand what are the laws who are the ministries and how do we execute citizenship policy in the country. We will then also understand through this how does one become and how does one not become an Indian citizen. We will understand the process of becoming an Indian citizen and the grounds on which a person's Indian citizenship can be taken away. And of course this has been in the news for quite some time, we'll understand the basics of the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019 in correlation with the census, the NPR, which is the National Population Register, and NRC, which is the National Register for Indian Citizens. And we'll close the lecture on the reading list as far as citizenship is concerned and what portions have to be done from your NCRT Class 11th Political Theory and your Lakshmi Kant, your 6th or your 6th revised edition. Now, let's begin with the dimensions of citizenship. To understand the dimensions of citizenship, like territory, which has multiple phenomena or multiple dimensions, such as a physical dimension to territory, an economic dimension to territory, a technological dimension to territory, and so on and so forth. And we had discussed these dimensions in our previous lecture, lecture number three, on territory, you can have a look at it in case you haven't uh, watched that lecture. Similarly, citizenship also has multiple dimensions which are often interrelated. So let's understand this in a rather simplistic format. Let us say we are talking about people in the territory of India, which means the concept of citizenship originates from where territory ends, which is why citizenship has been placed right after the portion on territory in the constitution where the constitution is is referring to territory in part one the constitution in part two refers to citizenship and we'll come to that in a bit so let us say we are talking about people who live in the territory of india in the physical territory of india in the domestic territory of india there are largely two kinds of people as we would know them to be one who are citizens and two who are non-citizens. Now, whether it is a non-citizen or an alien or a foreigner, they mean the same thing. One often confuses aliens with extraterrestrial beings, but that's not the point of this discussion. When we talk about aliens under law, we refer to people who are not citizens. Now, the fundamental difference between somebody who is a citizen and somebody who is not a citizen is a citizen has the ability to vote, a citizen has the ability to contest elections and a citizen also has the ability to formally hold public office. And these are the three basic advantages that you would get if you are a citizen of India as opposed to somebody who's not a citizen of India. 
In fact, in your NCRT textbook in class 11th, in chapter number 6, they have a theoretical and a very, very uh, conceptual discussion on the notions of citizenship, on the aspects of citizenship and citizenship and nation state theories. I will recommend you to read it towards the end of the lecture, but that's from where we derive these basic implications of citizenship. So when we say that somebody is a citizen of India, that person is entitled to vote, that person is entitled to contest an election, and that person is also entitled to hold public office. Now, of course, um, holding public office would mean both an elected office and an appointed office. In some rare scenarios, we may create certain exemptions to these, but you don't have to worry about them as far as the civil services prelims exam is concerned, right? But that's the fundamental difference. Now, the second most important understanding of the notion of Indian citizenship is, is essentially a means versus end. As far as citizenship is concerned, the means don't matter as long as you are an Indian citizen. Once you've become an Indian citizen, doesn't matter how you've become an Indian citizen, you're entitled to everything like any other Indian citizen. This is not the case in the United States, wherein people who are a certain type of US citizens, for example, somebody has become a US citizen by birth versus somebody who's become a US citizen by registration. They may not have the same kind of privileges as far as the United States is concerned. But that's not the case in India. In India, doesn't matter how you become an Indian citizen, as long as you are an Indian citizen, you're entitled to an exact equal amount of privileges. Of course, a certain class of citizens in terms of affirmative action, in terms of additional protection to be given as they may be vulnerable sections, those are implications of equality, which means the notion of, of citizenship is also closely interlinked with notions of equality, notions of freedom and notions of government. This your NCRT also refers to in one of its boxes when it refers to some work done by a theorist called Marshall, but again, not particularly relevant as far as your prelims is concerned. Anyways, when we talk about citizens, we understand that when we're looking at the type of citizens, there is going to be a geographical implication, there is going to be an economic implication, there is going to be a welfare implication as well. So let's first talk about the geographical implication. When we say there's a geographical implication to citizens, which means depending on how long does a citizen stay within the territory of India, gives them certain economic privileges or otherwise. And this is how you have largely two kinds of citizens, resident Indians or non-resident Indians or NRIs as popularly known. So what's the basic difference? Now the numbers are not important, approximately 180 days give or take. If you live in India for more than 180 days, approximately, uh, the numbers are not exact and not relevant for your prelims, then you are a resident Indian citizen. But if you are somebody who does not live in India for approximately 180 days in one financial year, then you are a non-residential Indian and therefore you are exempted from paying income tax and there are restrictions on you as far as purchasing or transacting agricultural property is concerned. And this is primarily because first, if you've not lived in India enough for you to have utilized Indian services enough, it would be unethical for you to pay taxes when you've not lived in India enough to use those services. And as far as agriculture is concerned, which is one of the most grassroots forms of property ownership, if you're not living in India, that means you're not going to be actively engaged in the business of agriculture. 
and we have to protect agricultural land as it is severely regulated by the state. There are a lot of benefits that come with ownership of agricultural land such as agricultural income becomes tax free and so on and so forth and, and you need to have an agricultural lineage to further purchase agricultural land. And if a non-resident Indian is given full-fledged rights to purchase agricultural property, it may lead to a commercialization of agricultural land which may not be in the best interest of the poor farmers who struggle to keep their lands their own. Which is also why these differences exist. So a geographical classification of citizens leads to an economic ramification between resident and non-resident Indians. Now in your newspapers, you may have heard of a word called ordinarily resident. Now this has nothing to do with, with a financial perspective. This is something that we understand in the context of the National Population Register, which we'll come to in just a while. So one dimension is geographical, which has an economic ramification. And now we look at a welfare dimension of citizens. Now, um, our constitution talks about this as well. In fact, in the, in the official comments to Article 5, the notion of domicile is mentioned. Now, of course, domicile means within India. And now in common parlance, domicile means are you holding the domicile of a state in the country? And you can only hold one state's domicile in, at one given point of time. Now, of course, there are uh, different kinds of domicile, domicile by choice, domicile by origin, domicile by operation of law. But none of this is again important for your exam. All you need to know is you can have only one domicile as an Indian citizen and domicile therefore becomes a welfare attribute wherein if you are a domicile of a given state you may be given a preference uh, for example in admission to higher educational institutions owned by the state government or let us say uh, some preference uh, in becoming a beneficiary for government schemes wholly and solely uh, funded and executed by the state government and so on and so forth but this is again something which is very welfare in nature now, irrespective of whether you are a resident Indian or a non-resident Indian, irrespective of which state's domicile do you hold or not, every Indian citizen enjoys all fundamental rights that there are. And we understand and we will understand this in a lot more detail when we study fundamental rights in the next lecture. But we understand that there are largely two kinds of fundamental rights, negative rights and positive rights. Uh, very similar to our discussions on negative liberty and positive liberty. So negative is bare minimum that can be done and positive is, is development of one's fullest potential. So a negative fundamental right is a bare minimum guarantee of the state against the state to ensure the citizen is protected. Whereas a positive fundamental right is support by the state in forms of activities or affirmative action so that the citizen can realize their fullest potential or the individual can realize their fullest potential. Now, whether it's a negative right or a positive right, it does not matter. All fundamental rights are equally available to all citizens, no matter what. And that's what makes citizens special. Now, this gives you a very interesting understanding as there are three variables that we're talking about. First is, of course, a citizen. The second is whether the citizen has been living in India or not. And the third is uh, whether the citizen has the domicile of a state or not. Right. Now, there can be several permutations and combinations in and around this. This is the most common permutation. This is the most common outcome that you are a citizen. This may apply to most of you watching this lecture. You are a citizen. You are a resident of India. You've been living in India for more than 180 days. That's fairly logical. And of course, you may be holding the domicile of a particular state.
right? You may come from a specific state, you would have spent your lifetime, your family may have spent their lifetime in that particular area. This is a very common occurrence. And then let us say there are people like me. So I'm a citizen of India. I, ha I live in India for more than 180 days in a year, but I do not hold the domicile of any state in India. Why? Because my father served in the army and therefore I didn't stay in a place long enough for me to get the domicile of that state. So I am technically a domicile-less citizen of the country. I, I don't hold the domicile of any state. And if I was living abroad for more than 180 days, the third option would apply to me. I would still remain a citizen of India and uh, I would still not hold the domicile of a state and let us say I would be living in another country. That is alright and that is perfectly fine. Similarly, there could be a person who is a citizen of India, may not be living in India uh, for more than 180 days and this person would have just moved uh, to another country for higher studies or for employment. So you would still hold the domicile of a state, it's just that you are not living in India for the time being. Similarly, there could be somebody who is neither a citizen and is not living in India for more than 80, 180 days or so and is not a domicile. This could simply be a, a non-citizen or a foreigner. Also, you could, you could be somebody who is not a citizen but lives in India and had, therefore you don't have a domicile because for you to have a domicile you must necessarily be a citizen foreigners do not get to become domiciles of a state so there are several permutation combinations that can happen in this framework as far as citizens are concerned now let's move here let's understand and let's let's figure out about people who are not citizens of India we could call them non-citizens, we could call them aliens, we could call them foreigners. Now there are broadly of two kinds. One, people who have valid documentation and people who don't have valid documentation. Right? Now what is valid documentation? Valid documentation usually comprises of two elements. One, that you have a legitimate passport you have a valid passport, your passport has not been expired, your passport is real and is not counterfeit or fake and you have a valid legal visa or a permission to stay in India. As long as you're fulfilling both of these requirements, you have valid documentation as far as we are concerned. And the second set of people are those who don't have this valid documentation, who may not have a valid passport or may not have a valid visa. Their visa might have expired or they would have not even had a visa. They would have, in, they would have just crossed a border uh, informally and they would have entered Indian territory. Now, there are further divisions here. When we talk about people who have valid documentation, it matters where they come from what country do they come from and therefore we have either friendly or we have enemy aliens and there is no uh, no clear cut definition which says x country is an alien country or x country is an enemy alien country this is done on a case to case basis this is done when the government issues orders and says citizens of following countries who are living in India at the moment on a valid visa are now going to be called enemy aliens or foreigners of XYZ countries are going to now be referred to or are being categorized as enemy aliens. Now what is the difference? Uh, first is that friendly aliens or, or anybody who is a non-citizen does not get any positive right, any affirmative action right. Very simply, reservation is affirmative action. Why will you give reservation to somebody who is not a citizen of India? You will have to first solve the problems at home. As we say in English, charity begins at home. We have to make sure that the inherent social injustice done to people for centuries and centuries must be corrected through affirmative ac action policies, for example, such as reservation. We would want to extend cultural and educational rights under 29 and 30 to citizens and not to non-citizens. These are examples of positive rights, right? Now, these positive rights are not available to 
non citizens at all there is only one exception to this which is article 21a which is right to education right to education is the only right which technically is is in a way positive but also has a negative connotation because india has ratified an international document called the un convention on rights of child of 1991 wherein we are obligated to make sure uh, we are providing universal education to a certain specific age group so whether it's a friendly alien or an enemy alien both of them get negative rights only and they also get right to education but enemy aliens don't get one negative right they don't get one specific negative right they get all other negative rights they get a 21 they get a 14 uh, they get a uh, they 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 get uh, your arrest they they get uh, your your religion rights all of that is okay that's not a problem what they don't get they don't get a right against preventive detention and there's a fairly logical reason behind this because there might be cases of espionage there might be cases of certain activities wherein citizens of that specific country who are in india may be engaged in and therefore they may not be given the protections of against preventive detention because national security is a universal reasonable restriction against all fundamental rights right so that's the basic understanding now the second set of of the second set of foreigners or the second set of non citizens when we talk about the second set of non citizens we understand that there are these are the people who are in india without any valid documentation they are in india without any legitimate paperwork per se but here also an ethical principle applies that the circumstances may have compelled these people to have fled their country or they would have just done it out of their own will if the circumstances were so severe and if a person due to a fear of life is made to flee their parent country then that person is called a refugee all right but if a person is moving from one part of the country to another part of the country then the person is not a refugee then the person is an internally displaced person and india has not ratified the un convention for protection of refugees which is why we are not under any international obligation to accept rohingyas wherein we faced a lot of criticism all across the world because of how we were treating uh, refugee issues that were surrounding us but those are refugees illegal migrants are those who simply without any compelling compelling circumstances uh, illegally uh, cross the border and are in india without illegal documentation though the law is a little bit of a gray area here but the general jurisprudence is even they get all negative rights and article 21 so this is the large of framework this is the ecosystem in which uh, citizenship uh, applies and sort of exists in the country now that we understand this we therefore now look at the policy of citizenship <coughs> when we look at citizenship policy the story begins from the constitution the constitution in part 2 articles 5 to 11 identifies certain provisions with respect to citizenship and the constitution in part 2 itself in fact article 11 empowers the parliament to create any law that the parliament wants on any matter relating to citizenship and citizenship has been categorically mentioned as entry number 17 or item number 17 in the union list of the seventh schedule and whatever is in the union list is the exclusive legislative domain of the parliament which means that the states of india have no role to play when they are determining citizenship provisions the states have absolutely no authority whatsoever to determine citizenship provisions this is nothing but an application of rule number 2 wherein the center is stronger than the states 
So citizenship therefore becomes an exclusive domain of the center, which is of course the parliament. So the constitution has a certain set of provisions. The constitution allows for the creation of certain laws. The parliament exercised this power and in 1955 created the principal law on citizenship called the Citizenship Act of 1955. It is this act which has been amended multiple number of times, whether it was 2003 or 2019. So this, the CAA 2019, the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019, it is basically an amendment to the Citizenship Act of 1955. It is changing certain provisions of the Citizenship Act of 1955. Right. So if you have to change constitutional provisions on citizenship because it's not mentioned, you will use the default constitutional majority, which is special majority two, which is more than two thirds of present and voting supported by more than half of the total strength of both the houses. Whereas when you are enacting an ordinary law, you would require just a simple majority. So when we understand that the parliament can make laws governing this, can make laws governing the entry and the exit of people to India, then the primary law of course becomes the Citizenship Act. The parliament has, uh, there are also uh, pre-independent legislation such as the Foreigners Act and the Passports Act, which also have certain implications, but you don't have to worry about them, just the names are enough, right? Now, we also are familiar with something called delegated legislation. Delegated legislation most commonly takes the forms of rules. For example, Motor Vehicles Act, Motor Vehicle Rules, Juvenile Justice Act, Juvenile Justice Rules, Mines and Minerals Act, Mine and Minerals Rules, right? So what are these rules? The Citizenship Act in one of its sections empowers the executive to draft certain rules which may contain certain technical guidelines. So what is the difference? An act needs to be passed by the parliament. Constitutional changes need to be authorized by the parliament. But the rules simply have to be notified by the concerned ministry. And the concerned ministry for the citizenship policy happens to be the Ministry of Home Affairs. Common mistake, most people think it's, it's the Ministry of External Affairs. But no, it is the Ministry of Home Affairs because you're looking at regulating people who are coming to India, which can be a law and order issue. The Ministry of External Affairs largely looks at emancipating Indian interests all across the world. So you've got the constitution, you've got the parliament to create further additional laws. Our primary law therefore becomes the Citizenship Act of 1955, which is supported by citizenship rules, which are usually drafted by the Ministry of Home Affairs. You have some older sort of, uh, uh, you know, redundant sort of laws called the Foreigners Act and the Passport Act. Now, what is the basic difference? And this is, this is immaculate wisdom of, of, of the lawmakers of our country. Constitutional provisions on, citizen, on, on citizenship largely deal with how do you become an Indian citizen as on the enforcement date of the constitution, which is 26th January 1950. After the enforcement of the constitution, after 26th January 1950, how do you become an Indian citizen and how can your citizenship be snatched away is actually mentioned here. And that is, that is impeccably wise because it's easier to change this than to change constitutional provisions. This requires a simple majority which could be done at the snap of a finger if you have a majority government as it has often happened in the history of the country. Whereas this would require a higher majority and is often deemed to be a constitutional amendment. There has never been any change uh, beyond a point to provisions here. This continues as it is. The changes that, that dramatically happen, they usually happen here in the Citizenship Act of 1955. Otherwise, there hasn't been a change 
per se. There has not been a single change here. Most of the changes have happened to the Citizenship Act of 1955 in multiple years, uh, 87, 2003 and of course most recently 2019. Now comes the important part. What I'm going to say next is of vital importance. While I understand that your standard reference books such as Lakshmi Kant give you very detailed technical provisions on how do you become an Indian citizen with a bunch of timelines which can sound very complicated. They will never be asked in the prelims exam because it is not in your prelims syllabus. Your syllabus says constitution, polity and rights issues. There has been no change to all of this. This is not in the constitution. So they will not ask you provisions of this in the exam. In 2021, when they asked you a question on citizenship, they basically asked you principles of citizenship, which is single citizenship and how all citizens are equal and it doesn't matter how you become an Indian citizen. They didn't get into the technical details and the timelines and so on and so forth. And therefore, it is my humble request to you, please don't waste your time trying to memorize these timelines, they are of absolutely no use to you either in the prelims or in fact in the mains as well. And it has been quite a few years since the CA of 2019 and there hasn't been any development on that front as well. So you can safely do this with a very limited capacity so to speak, right? So the constitution largely talks about two things. First, how do you become an Indian citizen up until 26th January 1950? And second is uh, the principle of single citizenship, which is that you're a citizen of India and not of any of the states of India. And two, you're a citizen of India and not of any other country. You can't hold two passports given an Indian citizen. So you can't have an Indian passport and you can't have the passport of any other country. Of course, now there are certain uh, diaspora schemes such as overseas citizens of India, but they still technically does not mean that you can have two passports. In India, you can only have one passport and you can't hold the citizenship of any other country and you're a citizen of India, not a citizen of a UPMP, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and so on and so forth. Right now, how do you become an Indian citizen as on 26 January 1950 uh, is there are there are several such provisions which are given. For example, you were born in the domicile or in the territory of India. You migrated from Pakistan. You went to Pakistan and then you came back from Pakistan. That's a reverse migration or let us say a person of Indian origin, which means that your ancestors could have been an Indian citizen did fulfill the criteria but they decided to take up the citizenship of another country so you can of course avail Indian citizenship. Again I am I'm reiterating it please do not do this for the prelims exam it's not needed as long as you know your basic principles of Indian citizenship you are fairly sorted you don't need anything else. Now the Citizenship Act of 1955 largely deals with two things first certain ways in which you can become an Indian citizen and two, the ways in which your Indian citizenship can be taken away. Now, uh, we'll quickly run through this. First, of course, is by birth. Now, there are three timelines to this. Uh, if somebody is born between 1950 to 1987, uh, then 1987 to 2003 and then 2003 and beyond. I have purposefully not given you exact dates. Otherwise, it's December 2003 and July 87 to December 2003 and January 1950 to July 87. I don't want to bother you with those details uh, just because I, I, I wish to show off certain factual details. But anyways, if you are born between 1950 to 1987, as long as you are born on Indian soil, that's all that matters. Uh, it doesn't matter who your parents were, doesn't matter what citizens your parents were of. If you were born in 87 to 2003, you have to be born in India and both of your parents have to be Indian citizens. But if you're born 2003 and beyond, then born in India, one of your parents has to be an Indian, an, an Indian citizen and the other parent does not or can't be an illegal migrant. The other parent has to be a legal migrant and therefore it is in the Citizenship Act for the first time do you see the phrase illegal migrant and the definition of this gets a little bit of change in the amendment to this act in 2019, right? So 
basic is today if a child is born in india today one of the parents has to be an indian citizen and the other can't be an illegal migrant which means the parent has to be a legal migrant and who is an illegal migrant there are certain differences that have been mentioned in 2019 which i will discuss in the next uh, uh, figure then descent is uh, you're born out of india uh, your basic premise is that you're born out of india at that and and when you are born one of your parents has to be an Indian citizen and within a stipulated period of time you have to apply for citizenship to the nearest Indian embassy who will then process your papers to the to the government at India and then of course you would be given Indian citizenship. But if you were born in a country which automatically makes you a citizen by birth then you will have to renounce or you will have to surrender the citizenship of that country if you want to become an Indian citizen even if you were born outside India. Now, whether it is citizenship by birth or whether it is citizenship by descent, these are automatic citizenships, which means this is almost like a right. You are entitled to this. There are no questions asked here. But the rest of the three forms, registration, naturalization and incorporation, in all of these three forms, it's an application based system. You have a citizenship division under the Ministry of Home Affairs which processes your application and on a case by case basis decides whether you should be given citizenship or not. Please for the prelims exam do not memorize the technical details here. There are a lot of eligibility criteria. All you need to know for example is let us say you've been married to an Indian citizen and you've been living in India for five years. Naturalization is far more discretion based. You may be somebody who would have served the government in any capacity. Uh, it could be in an advisory capacity, in an espionage capacity, uh, in, in foreign affairs, in security affairs and as a reward uh, the government wants to offer you Indian citizenship. Otherwise, the general criteria is that you should have been living in India for about 11 years. This also sees a minor change in the Citizenship Act of 2019. In fact, these are the two major changes that happened to the Citizenship Act of 2019, apart from certain regulatory changes in overseas citizens of India, which is nothing but a scheme to make sure Indian diaspora gets to come more frequently to India. Again, irrelevant as far as your prelims is concerned. And then is of course incorporation, which is an extension of territory. So for example, when enclaves were transferred from Bangladesh to India, and those people who were living in those enclaves had to be given express Indian citizenship, that was done through the process of incorporation. So these are the basic ways in which you can become an Indian citizen. I humbly request you all over again, Please do not memorize this in any further detail. You will not be asked this in the exam. And then of course there are three ways in which uh, your citizenship can be lost. The first is renunciation, which means you yourself tell the government of India that you do not want Indian citizenship. You are going to take the citizenship of another country and it was nice knowing you. Take care. Bye bye. Second is termination. When the government finds out that you have already obtained citizenship of another country and therefore the government is now terminating your Indian citizenship. The third is deprivation where the documents that you had submitted were fraudulent in nature, were improper in nature and therefore on the basis of fake documents the government is taking back the citizenship that was awarded to you. So these are the three broad grounds in which your citizenship can be revoked and birth, descent, registration, naturalization and incorporation are the grounds through which citizenship can be invoked. Again, not a word more than this is required as far as your prelims is concerned. Okay, now <clears throat> as far as a little bit of current affairs is concerned, let's understand this whole CAA, NRC thing to the point of importance as far as the pre is concerned. See, if you are taking the birth descent route, then if you are born in India, one of your parents is an Indian citizen, the other is not an illegal migrant, then you can directly apply for citizenship, right? Or you have come to India legally, you love the country and now you want to permanently become a part of India and therefore you want to apply for citizenship. The route is very simple. You have to be a legal migrant for you to be eligible for citizenship, whether it is under registration or naturalization. 
if you are an illegal migrant you cannot be given indian citizenship you will have to first become a legal migrant and then you would be eligible for citizenship this is your basic cycle and who is an illegal migrant is defined under the citizenship act of 1955 now the original definition as per this act was anyone without valid documentation is an illegal immigrant right or an illegal migrant right now in 2019 we made an amendment to this we changed the definition of illegal migrant we said anyone without valid documentation is an illegal migrant we understand that except now the law defines the religions hindus uh, jains uh, sikh uh, sikhs buddhists etc but for simplistic purposes except non muslims from afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan who have entered india before 2014 so if you are a non muslim from afghanistan bangladesh or pakistan who's entered india before 2014 then you are no longer an illegal migrant you are automatically a legal migrant now under registration or naturalization you are ready for applications to indian citizenship right it only makes you legible for indian citizenship it does not make you an indian citizen there itself right so for example let us say there is somebody who's a hindu who entered india illegally in 2000 that person becomes a legal migrant let us say there is somebody who is a jain from pakistan who illegally entered india in 2019 will still continue to be an illegal migrant because your cut off date is 2014 similarly if there is a person who is a muslim who is entered who from bangladesh who's entered india illegally in 2005 this person will continue to be illegal because this is only applicable for non muslims from here the rest of the story begins once you are legible once you are a legal migrant then you can apply under registration and naturalization ordinarily for legal migrants naturalization is 11 years but for these special people it is 5 years so if you are now you become a legal migrant so non muslims from abp nations who have entered india before 2014 only need to show residency in india for 5 years to become a citizen under naturalization everybody else will have to still show 11 years that's the only difference so for example let us say there is a legal muslim migrant who's entered india after 2014 will still take will have to show demonstrate 11 years but a legal non muslim migrant who has entered before 2014 will only have to take 5 years and a legal non muslim migrant after 2014 will still require 11 years because the cut off date was 2014 that's the key part and an illegal migrant irrespective of any religion will not be eligible for citizenship because you've got to be a legal migrant to be a citizen so this is your caa story this is all that there is of course uh, when we do an analysis of this in the mains there's a legal debate there's an ethical debate uh, there is a welfare debate there's an international obligation debate uh, th- there is there's a lot more that goes into it but because we are looking at it from the point of view of the prelims exam this is more than enough now how does this become the issue that it is there's something called the census which is governed by the census act uh, the first census happened in 1951 the last census happened in 2011 we could not undertake the 2021 census because of the pandemic what does the census do the census basically calculates everybody who's living within the territory of india on certain parameters they could be socio economic in nature age um, you know caste gender occupation levels of literacy which is why you will see through census a lot of other data comes out such as sex ratio such as literacy rates because this is your highest enumeration the most exhaustive enumeration that can happen at a national level right now therefore 
<coughs> this would happen in multiple stages you will first have national data then state data then local data and then you'll want to verify that local data by going to certain houses that is when later on the government introduces something called npr national population register that when the person has come to a house for census they will also ask for some npr related information what's the difference npr again is the enumeration of everyone citizens and non citizens both living in one particular place for 6 months this is called ordinarily resident what we were discussing in the first slide and wishes to live in the same area for 6 months more and of course you have certain biometrics that are recorded so in one way npr is a subset of census this is to ensure that your welfare schemes are more targeted and then npr becomes the foundation to nrc which is nothing but a list of indian citizens that's it now uh, there have been two nrcs in the history of this country so far one that was an all india nrc that happened in 1951 and the second is your nrc which only happened for the state of assam there has only been one all india nrc uh, with the 1951 census and the second time the nrc happened was only for the state of assam in 2019 on a supreme court order because uh, when when bangladesh was liberated in and around that time there was a lot of migration that happened from bangladesh to assam leading to a lot of civic political and economic unrest and therefore the natives of assam seemed to have a problem with it and had approached the supreme court right so when the nrc happened in assam you had to basically identify who are indian citizens living in assam so either you were related to the 1951 census or your name was in the electoral list of assam uh, uh, in 19 according to the 1971 pre march uh, voting list so this this is how nrc comes into play right now because of this several lakh people were left out they were then uh, put in detention camps they could challenge their nrc names uh, exclusions of it in in tribunals that were set up and so on and so forth now the problem is not this the problem is most people whose names would have been left out uh, most people who would have migrated from bangladesh to assam would have belonged to the islamic religion and most people therefore whose names would have been left out from assam's nrc which was released in 2019 with the cut off as 1971 would have been muslims the few who were not muslims will automatically become legal migrants as per ca because you have moved to india even if illegally before 2014 so therefore in one way it is the islamic population which seems to be severely affected by it now whether it's right or wrong is something which is for your mains classes and for ethics but for the prelims this is just enough you don't need anything else beyond what is be mentioned here this is very simply your ca nrc debate that's it don't bother with it in any more detail and this is all you need to know as far as citizenship is concerned your reading list is fairly simple class 11th ncrt chapter 6 of the political theory textbook 10 pages 82 to 92 only and only if you have some time if you don't have the time please don't read through it it's completely fine <coughs> as far as lakshmi gant is concerned the 6th and the 6th e edition which is the green book and the blue book are exactly the same the text hasn't changed one bit this is again coincidentally chapter number 6 only there are the first subheading that you have to do is meaning and significance there is a correlated table called table 6.1 with it which gives you a comparison between nris oci and pio only do headings 1 7 8 and 10 which is who's an nri what are the benefits that they get what is it that they can't do and so on and so forth don't do all the 10 points then you have the citizenship act of 1955 just read it once and read the current provisions then loss of citizenship read it fully and single citizenship as the subheading read it fully this should not take you more than one and a half hours to prepare maximum one and a half hours to prepare in addition to the lecture and then close this and then move on you don't have to spend a lot more time on this and therefore this covers our lecture on citizenship with all the dimensions that are necessary we'll now move to the next lecture in the next video 
on rights it's going to be a longer lecture because we're going to cover rights duties and directive principles all together <coughs> thank you and see you in the next one